Chapter 10 of The Art of Divine Contentment. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jen Raimundo. The Art of Divine Contentment by Thomas Watson. Chapter 10, Part 2. The sixth apology that discontent makes is disrespect in the world. I have not that esteem for men as is suitable to my quality and grace. And does this trouble? Consider, one, the world is an unequal judge. As it is full of change, so of partiality. The world gives her respects, as she doth her places of preferment, more by favor often than desert. Hast thou the ground of real worth in thee? That is best worth that is in him that hath it. Honor is in him that gives it. Better deserve respect and not have it, than have it and not deserve it. 2. Hast thou grace? God respects thee, and his judgment is best worth prizing. A believer is a person of honor, being born of God. Since thou wast precious in mine eyes, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Isaiah chapter 43 verse 4. Let the world think what they will of you. Perhaps in their eyes you are a castaway, in God's eyes a dove. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 14. A spouse, Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 1. A jewel, Malachi, chapter 3, verse 17. Others account you the dregs of offscouring of the world. 1 Corinthians, chapter 4, verse 14. But God will give whole kingdoms for your ransom. Isaiah, chapter 43, verse 3. Let this content. No matter with what oblique eyes I am looked upon in the world, if God thinks well of me, it is better that God approve than man applaud. The world may put us in their rubric, and God put us in his black book. What is a man the better that his fellow prisoners commend him, if his judge condemn him? O oh, labor to keep in with God, prize his love. Let my fellow subjects frown, I am contented, being a favorite of the King of Heaven. 3. If you are a child of God, you must look for disrespect. A believer is in the world, but not of the world. We are here in a pilgrim condition, out of our own country. Therefore must not look for the respects and acclamations of the world. It is sufficient that we shall have honor in our own country. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 14. It is dangerous to be the world's favorite. 4. Discontent arising from disrespect savors too much of pride. An humble Christian hath a lower opinion of himself than others can have of him. He that is taken up about the thoughts of his sins, and how he hath provoked God, cries out as agur, I am more brutish than any man, Proverbs chapter 30, verse 2, and therefore is contented, though he be set among the dogs of my flock, Job chapter 30, verse 1. Though he be low in the thoughts of others, yet he is thankful that he is not laid in the lowest hell, Psalm 86, verse 13. A proud man sets an high value upon himself, and is angry with others because they will not come up to his price. Take heed of pride. Oh, had others a window to look into their breast, as crates once expressed it? Or did thy heart stand where thy face doth? Thou wouldst wonder to have so much respect. The next apology is, I meet with very great sufferings for the truth. Consider one. Your sufferings are not so great as your sins. Put these two in the balance and see which weighs heaviest. Where sin lies heavy, sufferings lie light. A carnal spirit makes more of his sufferings and less of his sins. He looks upon one at the great end of the perspective, but upon the other at the little end of the perspective. The carnal heart cries out, Take away the frogs! But a gracious heart cries out, Take away the iniquity! Second Samuel chapter 24, verse 10. The one saith, Never any one suffered as I have done, but the other saith, Never one sinned as I have done. Micah chapter 7, verse 7. 2. Are thou under sufferings? Thou hast an opportunity to show the valor and constancy of thy mind. Some of God's saints would have accounted it a great favor to have been honored with martyrdom. One said, I am in prison till I be in prison. Thou countest that a trouble which others would have worn as an ensign of their glory. 3. Even those who have gone only upon moral principles have shown much constancy and contentment in their sufferings. Perseus, being bravely mounted and in armor, threw himself into a great gulf that the city of Rome might, according to the oracle, be delivered from the pestilence. And we, having a divine oracle, that they who kill the body cannot hurt the soul, 
Shall we not with much constancy and patience devote ourselves to injuries for religion, and rather suffer for the truth than the truth suffer for us? The Duchy among the Romans vowed themselves to death that their legions and soldiers might be crowned with the honor of the victory. Oh, what should we be content to suffer to make the truth victorious? Regulus, having sworn that he would return to Carthage, though he knew there was a furnace heating for him there, yet not daring to infringe his oath, he did adventure to go. We then who are Christians, having made a vow to Christ in baptism, and so often renewed in the blessed sacrament, should with much contentation rather choose to suffer than violate our sacred oath. Thus the blessed martyrs, with what courage and cheerfulness did they yield up their souls to God, and when the fire was set to their bodies, yet their spirits were not at all fired with passion or discontent. Though others hurt the body, let them not the mind through discontent. Show by your heroic courage that you are above those troubles which you cannot be without. The next apology is the prosperity of the wicked. I confess it is so often that the evil enjoy all the good, and the good endure all the evil, that David, though a good man, stumbled at this, and had like to have fallen. Psalm 73, verse 2. Well, be contented, for remember, one, these are not the only things, nor the best things. They are mercies without the pale. These are but acorns with which God feeds swine. You who are believers have more choice fruit, the olive, the pomegranate, the fruit which grows on the true vine, Jesus Christ. Others have the fat of the earth. You have the dew of heaven. They have a south land. You have those springs of living water which are clarified with Christ's blood and indulcerated with his love. 2. To see the wicked flourish is matter rather of pity than envy. It is all the heaven they must have. Woe to you that are rich, for ye have received your consolation. Luke chapter 6 verse 24. Hence it was that David made it his solemn prayer, Deliver me from the wicked, from men of the world, which have their portion in this life, and whose belly thou fillest with thy hid treasure. Psalm 17, verse 15. The word, methinks, are David's litany. From men of the world, which have their portion in this life, good Lord, deliver me. When the wicked have eaten of their dainty dishes, there comes in a sad reckoning which will spoil all. The world is first musical and then tragical. If you would have a man fry and blaze in hell, let him have enough of the fat of the earth. Oh, remember, for every sand of mercy that runs out of the wicked, God puts a drop of wrath into his vial. Therefore, as that soldier said to his fellow, Do you envy my grapes? They cost me dear, I must die for them. So I say, do you envy the wicked? Alas, their prosperity is like Haman's banquet before execution. If a man were to be hanged, would one envy to see him walk to the gallows through pleasant fields and fine galleries, or to see him go up the ladder in clothes of gold? The wicked may flourish in their bravery a while, but when they flourish as the grass, it is that they shall be destroyed for ever. Psalm 92, verse 7. The proud grass shall be mown down. Whatever a sinner enjoys, he hath a curse with it. Malachi chapter 2, verse 2. And shall we envy? What if poisoned bread be given the dogs? The long furrows in the backs of the godly have a seed of blessing in them, when the table of the wicked becomes a snare, and their honor their halter. The next apology that discontent makes for itself is the evils of the times. The times are full of heresy and impiety, and this is that which troubles me. This apology consists of two branches, to which I shall answer in specie, and branch one. The times are full of heresy. This is indeed sad. When the devil cannot by violence destroy the church, he endeavors to poison it. When he cannot with Samson's fox tails set the corn on fire, then he sows tares. As he labors to destroy the peace of the church by vision, sow the truth of it by error. We may cry out, we live in times wherein there is a sluice open to all novel opinions, and every man's opinion is his Bible. Well, this may make us mourn, but let us not murmur through discontent. Consider it one, error makes a discovery of men. Bad men, error discovers such as are tainted and corrupt. When the leprosy break forth in the forehead, then was the leper discovered. Error is a spiritual bastard. The devil is the father and pride the mother. You never knew an erroneous man, but he was a proud man. Now it is good that such men should be laid open, to the intent, first, that God's righteous judgment upon them may be adored. Secondly, that others who are free be not infected. If a man have the plague, it is well it breaks forth. 
For my part, I would avoid an heretic, as I would avoid the devil, for he is sent on his errand. I appeal unto you, if there were a tavern in this city, where under a pretense of selling wine many hogsheads of poison were to be sold, were it not well that others should know of it, that they might not buy? It is good that those that have poisoned opinions should be known, that the people of God may not come near either the scent or the taste of that poison. Error is a touchstone to discover good men. It tries the gold. There must be heresies, that they which are approved may be made manifest. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 19 Thus our love to Christ and zeal for truth doth appear. God shows us who are the living fish, such as swim against the stream, who are the sound sheep, such as feed in the green pastures of the ordinances, who are the doves, such as live in the best air where the spirit breathes. God sets a garland of honor upon these. These are they which came out of great tribulation. Revelation chapter 7 verse 14. So these are they that have opposed the errors of the times. These are they that have preserved the virginity of their conscience, who have kept their judgment sound and their heart soft. God will have a trophy of honor set upon some of his saints. They shall be renowned for their sincerity, being like the cypress, which keeps its greenness and freshness in the winter season. 2. Be not sinfully discontented, for God can make the errors of the church advantageous to truth. Thus the truths of God have come to be more beaten out and confirmed. As it is in the law, one may lay a false title to a piece of land. The true title hath by this means been the more searched into and ratified. Some had never so studied to defend the truth by scripture, if others had not endeavored to overthrow it by sophistry. All the mists and fogs of error that have risen out of the bottomless pit have made the glorious sun of truth to shine so much the brighter. Had not Arius and Sibelius broached their damnable error, the truth of those questions about the blessed trinity had never been so discussed and defended by Athanasius, Augustine, and others. Had not the devil brought in so much of his princely darkness, the champions for truth had never run so fast to scripture to light their lamps. So that God with a wheel within a wheel overrules these things wisely and turns them to the best. Truth is a heavenly plant that settles by shaking. 3. God raiseth the price of his truth the more. The very shreds and filings of truth are venerable. When there is much counterfeit metal abroad, we prize the true gold the more. Pure wine of truth is never more precious than when unsound doctrines are broached and vented. 4. Error makes us more thankful to God for the jewel of truth. When you see another infected with the plague, how thankful are you that God hath freed you from the infection? When we see others have the leprosy in the head, how thankful are we to God that he hath not given us over to believe a lie and so be damned? It is a good use that may be made even of the error of the times when it makes us more humble and thankful, adoring the free grace of God who hath kept us from drinking of that deadly poison. Branch 2 the second branch of the apology that discontent makes is the impiety of the times. I live and converse among the profane. Oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then would I fly away and be at rest. Psalm 55, verse 6. It is indeed sad to be mixed with the wicked. David beheld transgressors and was grieved, and Lot, who was a bright star in a dark night, was vexed, or as the word in the original may bear, wearied out with the unclean conversation of the wicked. He made the sins of Sodom spears to pierce his own soul. We ought, if there be any spark of divine love in us, to be very sensible of the sins of others, and to have our hearts bleed for them. Yet let us not break forth into mourning and discontent, knowing that God in his providence hath permitted it, and surely not without some reasons. For first, the Lord makes the wicked and hedge to defend the godly. The wise God often makes those who are wicked and peaceable, a means to safeguard his people from those who are wicked and cruel. The king of Babylon kept Jeremiah and gave special order for his looking to that he did want nothing. Jeremiah chapter 39 verses 11 and 12. God sometimes makes brazen sinners to be brazen walls to defend his people. Second, God doth but interline and mingle the wicked with the godly, that the godly may be a means to save the wicked. Such is the beauty of holiness that it hath a magnetical force in it to allure and draw even the wicked. 
sometimes god makes a believing husband a means to convert an unbelieving wife and a contra what knowest thou o wife whether thou shalt save thy husband or how knowest thou o man whether thou shalt save thy wife first corinthians chapter seven verse sixteen the godly living among the wicked by their prudent advice and pious example have won them to the embracing of religion if there were not some godly among the wicked how in a probable way without a miracle can we imagine that the wicked should be converted those who are now shining saints in heaven sometimes serve to diverse lusts titus chapter three verse three paul wants a persecutor augustine wants a maniche luther wants a monk but by the severe and holy carriage of the godly were converted to the faith the next apology that discontent makes is lowness of parts and gifts I cannot, saith the Christian, discourse with that fluency, nor pray with that elegancy as others. Grace is beyond gifts. Thou comparest thy grace with another's gifts. There is a vast difference. Grace without gifts is infinitely better than gifts without grace. In religion, the vitals are best. Gifts are a more extrinsical and common work of the spirit, which is incident to reprobates. Grace is a more distinguishing work, and is a jewel hung only upon the elect. Hast thou the seed of God, the holy anointing? Be content. 1. Thou sayest, thou canst not discourse with that fluency as others. Experiments in religion are beyond notions, and impressions beyond expressions. Judas, no doubt, could make a learned discourse on Christ, but well fared the woman in the gospel that felt virtue coming out of him. Luke chapter 8, verse 47. A sanctified heart is better than a silver tongue. There is as much difference between gifts and graces as between a tulip painted on the wall and one growing in the garden. 2. Thou sayest, thou canst not pray with that elegancy as others. Prayer is a matter more of the heart than the head. In prayer it is not so much fluency that prevails as fervency. James chapter 5 verse 16. Nor is God so much taken with the elegance of speech as the efficacy of the spirit. Humility is better than volubility. Here the mourner is the order. Sighs and groans are the best rhetoric. 2. Be not discontented, for God doth usually proportion a man's parts to the place to which he calls him. Some are set in an higher sphere and function. Their place requires more parts and abilities. But the most inferior member is useful in its place, and shall have a power delegated for the discharge of its peculiar office. The next apology is the troubles of the church. Alas, my disquiet and discontent is not so much for myself as the public. The church of God suffers. I confess it is sad, and we ought for this to hang our harps upon the willows. He is a wooden leg in Christ's body that is not sensible of the state of the body. As a Christian must not be proud of flesh, so neither dead flesh. When the church of God suffers, he must sympathize. Jeremiah wept for the virgin daughter of Zion. We must feel our brethren's hard chords through our soft beds. In music, if one string be touched, all the rest sound. When God strikes upon our brethren, our bowels must sound like an harp. Be sensible, but give not way to discontent. For consider one, God sits at the stern of his church. Psalm 46 verse 5. Sometimes it is a ship tossed upon the waves, afflicted and tossed, Isaiah chapter 54, verse 11. But cannot God bring this ship to haven, though it meet with a storm upon the sea? This ship in the gospel was tossed because sin was in it, but it was not overwhelmed, because Christ was in it. Christ is in the ship of this church, fear not, sinking. The church's anchor is cast in heaven. Do not we think God loves his church and takes as much care of it as we can? The names of the twelve tribes were on Aaron's breast, signifying how near to God's heart his people are. They are his portion, Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 9. And shall that be lost? His glory, Isaiah chapter 46, verse 13. And shall that be finally eclipsed? No, certainly. God can deliver his church not only from, but by opposition. The church's pangs shall help forward her deliverance. God hath always propagated religion by sufferings. The foundation of the church hath been laid in blood, and those sanguine showers have ever made it more fruitful. Cain put the knife to Abel's throat, and ever since the church's veins had bled. But she is like the vine, which by bleeding grows. 
and like the palm tree, which the more weight is laid upon it, the higher it riseth. The holiness and patience of the saints under their persecutions hath much added both to the growth of religion and the crown. Basil and Tertullian observe of the primitive martyrs that diverse of the heathen, seeing their zeal and constancy, turn Christians. Religion is that phoenix which hath always revived and flourished in the ashes of holy men. Isaiah saw asunder, Peter crucified at Rome with his head downwards, Cyprian, bishop of Carthage, and Polycarp of Smyrna, both martyred for religion. Yet evermore the truth hath been sealed by blood, and gloriously dispersed, whereupon Julian did forbear to persecute, not out of pity, but envy, because the church grew so fast and multiplied, as Nazians and Will observes. The twelfth apology that discontent makes for itself is this, It is not my trouble that troubles me, but it is my sins that do disquiet and discontent me. Be sure it be so. Do not prevaricate with God in thy own soul. In true mourning for sin, when the present suffering is removed, yet the sorrow is not removed. But suppose the apology be real, that sin is the ground of your discontent. Yet I answer, a man's disquiet about sin may be beyond its bounds in these three cases. One, when it is disheartening, that is, when it sets up sin above mercy. If Israel had only poured upon their sting, and not looked up to the brazen serpent, they had never been healed. That sorrow for sin which drives us away from God is not without sin, for there is more despair in it than remorse. The soul hath so many tears in its eyes that it cannot see Christ. Sorrow, as sorrow, doth not save. That were to make Christ of our tears, but as useful as it is preparatory in the soul, making sin vile and Christ precious. Oh, look up to the brazen serpent, the Lord Jesus. A sight of his blood will revive. The plaster of his merits is broader than our sword. It is Satan's policy either to keep us from seeing our sins, or if we will need see them that we may be swallowed up of sorrow. Second Corinthians chapter 2 verse 7 Either he would stupefy us, or affright us, either keep the glass of the law from our eyes, or else pencil out our sins in such crimson colors that we may sink in the quicksands of despair. 2. When sorrow is indisposing, it untunes the heart for prayer, meditation, holy conference. It cloisters up the soul. This is not sorrow, but rather sullenness, and doth render a man not so much penitential as cynical. 3 when it is out of season. God made us rejoice, and we hang up our harps upon the willows. He bids us trust, and we cast ourselves down, and are brought even to the margin of despair. If Satan cannot keep us from mourning, he will be sure to put us upon it when it is least in the season. When God calls us in a special manner to be thankful for mercy, and put on our white robes, Satan will be putting us into mourning, and instead of a garment of praise, clothe us with a spirit of heaviness. So God loseth the acknowledgment of mercy, and we the comfort. If thy sorrow hath turned unfitted thee for Christ, if it hath raised in thee high prizings of him, strong hungerings after him, sweet delight in him, this is as much as God requires, and a Christian doth but sin to vex and torture himself upon the rack of his own discontent. And thus, I hope, I have answered the most material objections and apologies which the sin of discontent doth make for itself. I see no reason why a Christian should be discontented, unless for his discontent. Let me, in the next place, propound something which may be both as a lodestone and a whetstone to contentation. End of chapter 10. Recording by Jen Raimundo.